please have a seat if you like or stand in the shade. Lovely to see all the visitors today. I am Doug Bradburn, President and CEO of George Washington's Mount Vernon, and I'm honored on behalf of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association to welcome you all here today to this storied place on a special day. Particularly want to welcome Ambassador Etienne uh, on Bastille Day. It's a day where we get to highlight at Mount Vernon the French contributions to our own national story and celebrate our affinity with the great values Liberté, Egalité, et Fraternité. And today at Mount Vernon we're going to reopen the Washington Bedchamber, uh, the Lafayette Bedchamber. <laughs> Now, in Mount Vernon, Bastille Day has a special resonance, and there's few elements to note. The day, as I noted, allows us to celebrate and reflect on the important and long alliance and the shared values of the American and French republics. Now, both of our national aspirations were born in a revolutionary age, and we both aspire to be exceptional nations. Neither of us are perfect. Uh, and because friends can point out imperfections, and we are very good friends, we regularly help and encourage each other to live up to our lofty ideals. But it is important to remember, I think, that some of humanity's great advances in the growth, meaning, and defense of freedom have come when America and France have worked together. We have neither been great as great alone as we have been together. It's not hyperbole to note that we, the United States, would not have won our national struggle for independence without French aid. It was shocking to them, Mr. Ambassador, to hear that. Here at Mount Vernon, the reality is embodied forcefully by the example of the great volunteer, the Marquis de Lafayette, who combined a dashing and boundless energy and courage with a romantic enthusiasm for the cause of liberty. He bled in the cause of American freedom and gave generously and passionately to improve the world that he inherited. And he was beloved of the Washington family. His portrait and his family portrait hung in the front parlor, the room in the mansion house reserved for family likenesses. He was an adopted son. He pushed General Washington to be a better man, a better representative of the cause of not only American but universal liberty. He helped him win the war for independence, helped Americans abandon regional prejudices for the common good, and helped them imagine a world without slavery, having a definitive impact on George Washington's own decision to emancipate his slaves in his will. Today, we celebrate Bastille Day with the reopening and the redecorated and restored Lafayette bedchamber. It is the room that Lafayette stayed in on his victory tour of the United States in 1784, solidifying the friendship between nations in peace that had been forged in war. Ever after his famous visit here to Mount Vernon, the room would be known as Lafayette's Room, and a painting of the Frenchman, personally commissioned by George Washington, dominated the space. Today, you will see the room with a fresh, new, old wallpaper, furnishings, bed hangings, and a copy of the painting of Lafayette by Charles Wilson Peale, the original of which is on view in our museum. The reinstallation of Lafayette Room at Mount Vernon is the culmination of an extensive multi-year project of research and cosmetic architectural treatments, utilizing extensive documentary, documentary evidence, paint analysis, and other information to recover the room's multi-layered history and appearance. The room looks as it did in 1799, the last year of, the Washington, of George Washington's life, as the rest of the house does as well. I'd like to particularly thank the staff, their innovations, their brilliance, their hard work to make it come together, but also I'd like to thank the people that helped fund it. Mount Vernon doesn't receive any tax dollars from the United States. This is a place that's built on the same voluntarism that Lafayette showed when he volunteered in the cause of liberty. And it's because of our great donors that we're able to keep this place alive and constantly restored. So I'd like to particularly mention the Karen M. and Jefferson Kirby, the Florence Gold Foundation, the Felicia Fund, the estate of Paul and Sally Hoytinger, Mr. and Mrs. Dillard Kirby, George Shields Foundation, the Brown Foundation, an anonymous donor, and others from across the country, including Mr. Philippe Proper 
and Richard and Susan Ammerman who are here with us today. Thank you. Now, the masterful execution of the bedchamber reflects our ongoing effort to preserve and interpret this whole place using the latest research. It's a constant battle with the elements, with time, but it's in a constant excitement of rediscovery of new knowledge. And we do this so that we can connect visitors to the way things were, to the past, to educate, to understand the legacies and intertwined stories that inform our present world. We do it to inspire visitors, to learn about the continuities that we're all a part of, and the responsibilities bequeathed to us by the men and women who launched the great enlightenment experiments in democracy. Which leads to me my second point about the importance of Bastille Day at Mount Vernon. Namely, we have the key to the Bastille here at Mount Vernon. And, and, and as you know, July 14th, 14, or 1789 marks the destruction of that ancient arsenal and prison, the Bastille. It's remarkable that this token of liberty resides here, given to President George Washington by the Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette, in charge of the French National Guard at the dawn of their great revolution, wrote that the key was, quote, the main key to the fortress of despotism. It is a tribute which I owe, he wrote, as a son to my adoptive father, as an aide-de-camp to my general, as a missionary of liberty to its patriarch. Now, George Washington received this key as President of the United States. The key hung in the presidential mansions in New York and Philadelphia, where the first Congress of the United States saw this token of another great revolution. All the first ambassadors saw this key there, including the first ambassador from the French Republic, the citizen Genet. Now, when Washington retired from the presidency, the key came back to Mount Vernon, and he placed it in the central passage of the mansion house, where it has hung for 225 years. Nearly 100 million people have seen the key hanging quietly, this symbol to the birth of modern liberty. It has been visited over the years by many dignitaries and, of course, many heroes of the French nation. It was 105 years ago, Mr. Ambassador, that the French Minister Vivendi and the Field Marshal Joffre, the hero of the Marne, visited the key to the Bastille and laid a bronze palm on the tomb of Washington and pledged to fight the great war to completion in honor of the dead and with their new ally, the United States, so that democracy and not autocracy would rule the future of Europe. And it was a week before Bastille Day, on July 7, 1944, when General de Gaulle visited the tomb of Washington in the key of Bastille at Mount Vernon. By the end of August, he was in Paris, newly liberated from Nazi despotism. And of course, I was honored myself to introduce the key to President and Mrs. Macron, along with the First Lady and President Trump, as we celebrated an evening together at Mount Vernon in 2018. But not only French heroes have been inspired by the key, Mr. Ambassador, it was 11 months ago, at the end of August 2021, that President and First Lady Zelensky stood in the Central Passage and looked at the key to the Bastille. And we spoke together of the importance of the French Revolution as an inspiring example to all nations seeking the blessing of liberty during their visit they were celebrating 30 years of the independence of Ukraine. And now, of course, they're fighting desperately for that independence and to share in the legacy of liberty inspired by the democratic revolutions of the 18th century. The criminal invasion of Ukraine, if allowed to succeed, would set up another fortress of despotism in Europe. And on this Bastille Day, I thank the French people, President Macron, Ambassador Etienne, for their leadership in strengthening the resolve of NATO and extending the hospitality of the EU so that the values we share, embodied in the generosity, liberality, eclat, and courage of Lafayette, can live on wherever free people struggle for liberty. Thank you all for being here on this beautiful Bastille Day. Vive la liberté, vive la France. The ambassador. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Doug, uh, for your words and uh, um, dear friends, dear visitors, thank you for being here. And of course, we are delighted with my wife to be here again in Mount Vernon 
on this very, very special day for the unveiling of the Marquis de Lafayette's uh, bedchamber as it has been restored. Thank you to all who have made this restoration possible. It's a moving experience for, for me to see this restored room where Gilbert Dumotier, Marquis de Lafayette, stayed, I think, on two occasions in uh, 1784, and then again, did he stay here in 1824? Uh, he didn't stay here, he just visited. He visited. His son, George Washington de Lafayette, also spent two and a half years here, beginning February 1795, during the French Revolution and the, these hard, very hard years for Marquis de Lafayette. I would like in these days, on this day, to give special thanks to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association and all of the generous donors. And this room will remain a shining testimony to everything that we owe this champion of freedom. We could not have chosen a better day, as you said, Doug, to pay tribute to the Marquis and to his friendship with the American people. Bastille Day is indeed the day when France celebrates the unity of the French people and their emancipation from all forms of despotism. It embodies the values on which our country, and I would say our countries, are founded. You know that the, the three core values which we identify with the French Republic are liberty, equality, and fraternity. These are values, indeed, that we share between our peoples. And we don't forget that the American people proclaimed their independence 13 years before the French Revolution. In 2024, the bicentennial anniversary of the Marquis de Lafayette's farewell tour of the United States, we will have a special opportunity to, to, to commemorate again our shared history of fighting for freedom. As a key player in the American Revolution and later the French Revolution, the Marquis de Lafayette is the ideal symbol of the friendship between our two countries. At a time when the values that he championed his entire life are being threatened, in particular by the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine, it is more important than ever for us to shine a light on this heroic figure. The Mount Vernon Ladies Association has done a brilliant job with this restoration. The portrait of the Marquis de Lafayette that hangs on the wall serves in the bedroom, serves as a reminder of the need to continue to fight for freedom and solidarity all over the world. I would like to conclude with these words written by the Marquis to his wife in 1777. They are the perfect illustration of his friendship, but also with the newly formed United States, but also of his ideals. I quote, defender of the liberty that I idolize myself more free than anyone in coming as a friend to offer my services to this intriguing republic, I bring to it only my frankness and my goodwill, no ambition, no self-interest. Once again, thank you all for your attention and happy Bastille Day. Vive les États-Unis, vive la France, vive l'amitié franco-américaine. And now I'd like to welcome a very special guest who's decided to join us today, the Marquis de Lafayette himself. Monsieur le Président. Bonjour mes amis. Bonjour mes amis. Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. Monsieur le Président. Mesdames et Messieurs, my name is Marie Joseph Paul Ivroch Gilbert Dumotier, the Marquis de Lafayette. You may call me General for short. And it is a great honor and pleasure for me to join you on this day 
not only when we celebrate the alliance between our two countries, but also to celebrate the reopening in all of its restored majesty, what may very well be my favorite room in the building behind me, if not all of America, the Lafayette bedchamber. My journey to having a name in common with a room in this stately home begins on a hot summer day, much like this one in the city of Metz in Eastern France, when in 1775, I was a young soldier, but 17 years old, very far from my home in Paris, very far from my family in Auvergne. But we were joined on that day by no less a distinguished guest than His Royal Highness the Duke of Gloucester, the very brother of King George III, traveling from London to Italy. And he shared with us at a dinner that evening, with all of the officers in attendance, news of events that were at that very moment uh, unfolding here in the New World where it seems a group of insurgents had taken up arms against the king's own soldiers, and where a congress of colonial Americans meeting in Philadelphia had selected a gentleman from the Southern Territory of Virginia, George Washington, to lead a continental American army. Well, my friends, I felt in this moment that my heart was enlisted and that my military career in France was not worth pursuing if all of the exciting battles were being fought here on this side of the Atlantic. But whatever my desire to bring honor and glory to the family name of Lafayette, from the first time I heard America's name pronounced, I knew that I loved her. And when I learned that she was fighting for her freedom, I too wished to shed my blood for her. The days that I have spent fighting for her, I shall count among the happiest of my entire life. And yet two years later, when I arrived in Philadelphia, waving my letters from Dr. Franklin in the face of the Congress, they simply did not know what to do with me. Yes, they made me a general, but I had no troops to command. They considered me nothing more than a glamorous supernumerary, an honorary rank, a, a decorative rank. I began to ask why it was that I had come all of this way to America, but I did not have to wait long for my answer. Because shortly after I received my commission, I was invited to dine with members of Congress at the City Tavern in Philadelphia, and that is where I first met General Washington. And his presence seemed to draw the air from the chamber. It was another warm summer day, much like this one, and everyone was distracted by his presence. And there I was, sitting down at the other end of the table from him, a, a thin youth, 19 years old, in a new uniform. He, must have considered me nothing more than a young puppy dog who had wandered in off the street. But when the dinner was concluded, he spoke to me very kindly. He complimented me on the service and the sacrifice that I had made in support of the American cause, and told me it would please him if I considered the home of the Commander-in-Chief my home, and that I would consider myself a part of his family. And this word struck out at me like a sort of bolt family. Because once again, there is a very similar word, of course, in French, the word famille, but it refers primarily to relatives of the blood, you see. I learned in short order that His Excellency was referring to his military family and the officers under his command at headquarters. But for a moment, I believed it was His Excellency's intention to adopt me as his son, right then and there. For, of course, I knew he had no sons of his own, I never knew my own father, and indeed in time, he became as much a father to me as I have ever known. When we reviewed our forces for the first time together, he turned to me and with a touch, I believe, of embarrassment in his voice, said to me, my dear Marquis, it is clear that you have much to teach us. And I simply responded, Your Excellency, I have not come here to teach, but rather to learn. I was trying to assure him that I was no soldier of fortune, but I believe this moment endeared me to him because from that moment forward, he truly did become as much a father to me as I have ever known. At every opportunity in my life, I have sought to follow his example, both as a soldier under his command and then when I returned to France and asked to serve first in the Assembly of Notables, then the Estates General, then the National Assembly and its Vice Presidents. And then on the 14th of July, 1789, the anniversary of which we meet today, it was decreed that uh, in, the, uh, in the destruction of the Bastille, Paris would convene uh, and, and uh, 
would form a unit of la Garde Nationale, the National Guard, to maintain order in the city and that I would be selected to lead it. I thought of His Excellency when I accepted this command. And when I retired to private life, I wished to make for myself my own personal Mount Vernon at the Chateau Lagrange. And we should not forget that this house sheltered two generations of Lafayette, both myself and, and as has been said, my son, George Washington Lafayette. When I returned to the, the grounds of Mount Vernon in 1824 as the nation's guest, and I visited the tomb of His Excellency, I remember the day in 1784 when I left the Lafayette bedchamber. I said goodbye to His Excellency for the last time. Our carriages diverged on the road north. I wrote to him that I was sure I would see him again. And he was hopeful that I was right, but in his heart he knew that I was not. It would be the last time I saw His Excellency alive. But there, in His Excellency's tomb, I took comfort in the knowledge that he played host to another part of me that bore his name, my son, George Washington Lafayette. My friends, I fear I have already wasted far too much of your valuable time with these tales of old soldiering. I wish you all a very excellent continuation of your day. Je vous souhaite tous et toutes une très agréable continuation de votre journée. Bonne fête nationale. Joyeux 14 juillet. Merci beaucoup à vous tous. Well, thank you all so much for being here, and we're going to go see the opening 